Hello, I'm Mark Baer. Welcome to Muse. I'm the executive director of the Museum of Monterey. We're shooting in the Museum of Monterey. My guest, Tim Thomas, has spent a long time in this museum, as, uh, as we were previously the Maritime Museum. And Tim has just recently written a new book called The Abalone Kings. Here's the cover of the weekly. Uh, let's hold up the book. And uh, somewhere here I have the poster, but uh, I'll get that too. <laughs> we got the book. We don't need the poster so much. No, this is okay. it. So uh, anyway, welcome. Thank you. And we're talking about Pop Ernst and... Ernest. Oh, well, it could be both. We're oh, Pop sure. Ernest. It's one of the... Pop Ernest. Yeah. Okay. Actually, it was Ernst. That's a, a big question. Was it Ernst or Ernest? And uh, it's actually both. Okay, so I'm not way off. Right. No, you're not okay. way off. So... Again, let's talk about the abalone. King. Sure. Pop Ernst. Right. So he had a restaurant. He had two restaurants here in Monterey. Initially coming here about 1907, opening a little restaurant called Cafe Ernest on Alvarado Street. And then he left Monterey for a few years, went to San Francisco, came back to Monterey in 19, uh, 1917, actually lived at Point Lobos for a couple of years. We worked as an abalone broker, and then he moved to the Monterey Wharf and opened the very first restaurant on, on the foot of the Monterey Wharf called Popperness. And it was, he became known as the Abalone King. What, why did, so let's talk about what he did. Well, he was a German restaurateur and actually moved to the United States into New York City actually when he was 17 years old um, and worked in the restaurant trade there. And just sort of worked his way up from the lowest ranks in the restaurant, I guess from busboy to the working into the kitchen. And then when he, uh, five, uh, 21, 22, he got his national, he became an American citizen and he moved west, ended up in San Francisco working at the Cliff House and a number of other restaurants in San Francisco. And in those days, San Francisco restaurants were, were famous and there were actually more restaurants per capita in San Francisco than any other city in the United States at that time. And uh, he just became, uh, worked a lot in the restaurant trade running his own restaurants, uh, a place called the Trocadero, uh, and had a beer garden, all kinds of things. But he was always on the move for whatever reason, and eventually he ended up in Monterey in uh, 1907, opening a small restaurant on Alvarado Street. Okay, so the abalone, the abalone king, and he was the one that figured out how to make oh, this abalone, thing tasty. He did. Abalone was around, and, but no one really understood how to utilize it. I mean, well, you, know, it's, you know, unless you prepare a property, it's like eating a rubber boot. And so uh, he understood, he, you know, Japanese were here diving abalone. They came about 10 years before Pop did, and they were drawing all that abalone and shipping it, shipping it over back to Japan, shipping it to China, shipping it to uh, Australia and Hawaii. And there was a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment actually at that time in the United States. And so there was a big push to stop the Japanese from even shipping any abalone out of California. Um, he was taking into his restaurant and began to experiment with it. And he sort of prepared it like Wiener schnitzel. You know, initially he sliced the foot. His plan was to make an abalone steak. I mean, nobody was making abalone steaks. And he, and he came up with this theory, a plan of pounding it with a wooden mallet you know, not too much, but just enough to sort of break it up and then, and then cooking up quickly in olive oil, egg wash, cracker crumbs. And uh, some people came from all over to eat fresh abalone steaks in his restaurant. And then, uh, of course, we all know about the abalone song, the history right. here. Right. So let's talk about his relationship with the art community. Sure, and he had a big, big relationship with the arts community. So he actually worked, before coming to Monterey that first time, he actually worked uh, from time to time at the Bohemian Club in San Francisco. We got to know a number of real Bohemians, folks like George Sterling and Sinclair Lewis. And these folks had been moving to the Monterey area, especially George Sterling. I mean, George Sterling was essentially considered the Bohemian king when he came to Monterey. And they actually were the first to big, they would hold these abalone picnics at Carmel Beach and bring abalone uh, gather from the beach there, cooking it up in these little black pots. And as they pounded it, uh, they would write these little abalone ditties. Like some folks boast to quail on toast because they think it's Tony, but I'm content to owe my rent and live on abalone. Which we think was actually written by a woman named Opal Heron, who was an artist in Carmel. Her husband founded the Forest Theater. Um, and also, I, Pop was probably, knew, he knew those guys. So he probably was actually at some of those picnics. Um, and so probably sort of 
gave me the idea about this abalone steak. So how did you, let's talk about the book and how did you come to write the book? And first of all, before we do anything, right. available on Amazon, available Amazon, where? It's available uh, here at the Bookworks and PG and most of the bookstores in the Monterey area, yeah. And I, and JCL, to Dr. Me here consistently has several copies of it. Okay, and then uh, your publisher? History Press. Out of Charleston? Out of South Carolina, yeah. Uh, South, uh, South Carolina. Yeah. They are a wonderful press. Working with yeah. your publicity people right. has been fabulous. Good, thank you. Um, you have an event coming up here at the museum. July 12th, I think it is. Yeah. It's book signing. And I got a little lecture about Pop Ernest, I assume. Okay, we've taken care of some business. Now let's get back to the book. So let's talk about how did, how did, how did you come about writing this Well, book? Pop is a, a name that, and you know I grew up with around here, although he died in 1934. You know, there's a famous menu, actually, when you talk about artists, that was designed for the restaurant that he had commissioned from the art, from, uh, for the restaurant in 1930 or so from Joe Mora and Armin Hansen. And it's a very famous menu and it sort of a caricature of Pop Ernest, the cooking abalone. And it sort of created this, he's also created this persona of this character, this Pop Ernest character. And so there's sort of this mythological thinking about who he was. I mean, he died in 1934, but I've talked to many, many people who were convinced they met him when he was, you know, although they would have been way too young to have known the guy. Um, so it's a name I've always heard. And I've been researching the history of the fisheries of Monterey for 25 years. And that restaurant was right in the center of all of that because all that fresh fish that was being caught in this bay was being served in this restaurant. So besides Avalon, he really was responsible for, for really introducing not just Montereyans, but really the world, a lot of really fresh kind of fish that's only found in the Monterey area that he was preparing in his restaurant. And you used this book as a vehicle to tell a lot of the other yeah, history here. Mainly a big story of the Japanese, but also early sardine fishery development and all kinds of things in that book. Let's talk about your um, relationship with the Japanese community and what you're doing now. I think that's important. Well, I've been working, that, again, because of my research with the fisheries, this led me to the Japanese story, which is sort of an undertold story because you know those guys coming here in the late 1890s and really dominated the fishing in this bay. You know, and it, well, honestly, what, what really was the key for me was abalone because abalone connects everything. Because it was abalone that brought the Japanese fishermen, abalone and salmon, um, uh, Japanese salmon fishermen coming here in the 1890s that got their catching large uh, catches of salmon in the bay, uh, which got the attention of a guy named Frank Booth who came to Monterey to get salmon. Uh, uh, they opened the opened a cannery near the Monterey Wharf. They began to fish large sardine as a small temporary fishery. And then uh, so it was all started, which eventually sardine fishery, of course, become the largest fishery of a single fish in the history of the United States, all because of abalone. Wow. And Pop Ernst. And Pop Ernst. Without that a recipe that he develops, um, the industry really would have died uh, in 1915. So in 1915, the state of California um, passed a law you know, saying, saying that abalone could not be exported out of the state of California. Yeah, but that recipe, and because of the, the recipe, and then they, they introduced this sort of fresh abalone steak to San Francisco in 1915 during the uh, Panama Pacific World's Fair. Uh, it was such a demand for this product. By 1920, there were nine full-time Japanese companies operating off the Monterey Wharf. And one of the things really I thought was amazing is in 1929, the California abalone industry, this brought in almost a million dollars in revenue. 75% of it right here in Monterey. Wow. So it's quite amazing to think yeah. that a, a dish on a menu yeah. can change a history. It does. You know, and also, he, in 1925, uh, went down and bought a large piece of property in the Big Sur area, Anderson Creek, right around where uh, Esalen Institute is, and created an abalone farm. I mean, that was no one, and I was thought of doing a doing such a thing like that. I talked to a lot of folks who are in that business today and they said no way and would do that. Unfortunately, they weren't able to get it to go because they couldn't get the abalone to, to reproduce, but at least the idea that was there that started all of this is all because of that So, so all the, the, the thinking of yeah. uh, um, th that kind of progressive thought is yeah. uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. And then w when did we, when did um, abalone become endangered and when did it run? Well, it really started changing in the 70s. Um, commercial abalone fishery really up, up into the, I believe, into the early 1990s even, but there were a number of things. Number one, in 1948, a guy by the name of Jacques Cousteau invented the aqualung, and so everybody could go out there and get abalone. That really, really, really hurt the industry. 
But then in the 70s and 80s, there were a number of El Nino storms that came in and wiped out kelp beds that abalone live with, or eat kelp. You know, that was part of it. There was a disease called the withering foot disease in the 1980s that killed a lot of the abalone. And so I believe in the early 90s, California Department of Fish and Game uh, stopped the commercial fishery of abalone. In fact, today you can only, uh, you can only get abalone for your own personal use north of the Golden Gate. And you have to free dive for it, and it's very heavily regulated, and you only can get, I believe, two at a time, I think it is how it works, but it's very heavily regulated today. That's why it's so expensive on the restaurant menu today. I mean, you, up until the 80s, you could get abalone steak dinner on my order for about 10 bucks. So this yeah. is pretty incredible. Now it's about 75. <laughs> So you, you, you're, you're well versed in the history. What's next for you here? Where, where, what other aspects of the history are undertold here? I think the Japanese story to me is a lot more of that story that could be told. Um, I think there's a lot of misunderstandings and myths really about Cannery Row actually uh -huh. and, uh, and how that whole industry down there and I think that's a real, I, I do walking tours. I do a, every day I do walking tours of Cannery Row and people are always amazed about those stories about what really happened down there and how that, how that street really operated. And we tend to think of it in, in, through the eyes of, of John Steinbeck's books. But the truth is Can the book Cannery Row isn't really about cannery workers or starting fishermen. I mean, that book could take place in Broken Toe, Idaho. It doesn't really matter. Uh, so but that real story of those real people is, is an amazing story to me. And it's very multicultural. I mean, it's not, it's just it's really an amazing thing. Um, one of the things I have to thank you for and is that you brought Roy Hattori in before he passed away. So that was a big, I'm, I'm so happy that we have that footage of Roy telling his story. Yeah, me too. Roy is a big part of my life. I knew Roy for 25 years. He and I used to go around to different places to talk about his Abilene, Abilene diving days. He's a big part of this book, actually. So uh, the whole chapter is devoted to Roy Hattori. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. Um, so, um, so you're do how do people find you, uh, again, in your walking tours? So I have a company called Monterey Waterfront Canaro Walking, Monterey Waterfront Canaro Tours, and you can go find out a web, web page. You can also email me at timsardine at yahoo.com, and I'm easy to find. So this is, again, the name of the book, The Abalone King of Monterey. We're talking about Pop Ernest. I want to I call him Pop Ernest. I, yeah, you know what it is, if he came to the United States, his actual name was Ernst Ludwig Dolter. And then when he came west, he got his naturalization papers. They added an extra E to his name. He westernized it. He became Ernest. And so uh, it was Ernst and Ernst. Fabulous. Uh, again, my guest, Tim Thomas, by his book. Yes, please. A pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it. You've been watching Muse. We will be back. You're live at the Museum of Monterey. Thank you.